people can sit back and say, oh, this will never happen to my child. Well, guess what? It happened to my niece. Amanda's disappearance is big news. Her family, led by her mother, Luana Miller, does everything possible to keep people looking for Amanda. Her mother even agrees to go on television to ask a TV psychic if Amanda is alive. Before an audience, she's told her daughter is dead. So you don't think I'll ever see her again? Yeah, in heaven, on the other side. I can't understand why she's such a good girl. Investigators dug into a prisoner's tip. Nothing of evidentiary value, nothing found in the dirt at all. Cleveland police still don't know where Amanda Berry is, but they know where she isn't. And for her family tonight, that's enough. Day by day, I just think either she's going to come home or one day I'm going to find my peace. Almost a year later, the third captive is taken. It's April the 2nd, 2004. Gina De Jesus, aged 14, is on her way home from school. She's at the junction of West 105th Street and Lorraine Avenue. A car pulls up. She recognises the driver as Mr Castro, the father of one of her friends. Castro offers Gina a lift home. Her family realise something's wrong when she isn't home at her usual time. Gina's reported missing. One of the most uncomfortable facts about this story is that the De Jesus and Castro families know each other well. Nancy Ruiz, Gina's mother, grew up with Ariel Castro in the same neighbourhood. When Gina's family held vigils for their daughter, Castro would play music, dedicate songs to her and hug Gina's mother. He also joined searches and handed out flyers. With two teenagers disappearing from the same neighbourhood in less than a year, people are angry and demanding action. Volunteers publicise appeals for Amanda and Gina, but Cleveland TV reporters fear the worst. Gina and Amanda are about a year apart. Uh, that something's wrong, something doesn't add up here because well, coming home from school, working at a Burger King, these are not bad kids. Uh, and the proximity of you know, a couple of blocks apart, it, it, it just didn't add up. So that's why I think these two cases got such attention uh, from the media. It didn't necessarily help. If you see it, say it. On April the 22nd this year, two weeks before the discovery, local TV marks the 10th anniversary of Amanda Berry's disappearance. If she is still alive, tomorrow will be Amanda Berry's 27th birthday. The 17-year-old disappeared walking home from work, which was at this Burger King on West 110th and Lorraine. A decade's worth of investigation drummed up lots of leads, but no real answers here. But someone does have the answer. He's the man who kidnapped Michelle, Amanda and Gina and drove them three miles away to his ordinary-looking house, where they've been captive for 10 years. His name is Ariel Castro. So who is Ariel Castro? And how was he able to maintain a job, a social life, be a member of this community, yet keep three women hidden in his house for so long? For his Facebook page, he just looks like an ordinary guy. 28 friends, just a catalog of banal posts, some of which seem sinister or loaded in retrospect, but Miracles really do happen. God is good. He posted four days before the girls were found. He shared a post which reads, a real woman will not use their child as a weapon to hurt the father when the relationship breaks down. Do not lose sight of the fact that it's the child that suffers. He said, true that. This morning I woke up to the sound of a chirping cardinal. Yes, come on spring. Actually, all totally innocuous. But then why wouldn't they be? He's hardly going to write something incriminating. It occurs to me that, in fact, social media provides the perfect opportunity for someone like this to present an artifice of normality. It seems that no one suspected the man who played bass in a local salsa band. Ariel Castro was also protected by his family's reputation. The Castros are said to be pillars of the Puerto Rican community in Cleveland's west side. His cousin Maria Montes agreed to speak to me. She describes Ariel Castro's immediate family as tight-knit. How close were you to Ariel? Um, well, we were very close when we were younger. 
Um, he was not born and raised here in Cleveland. He was born in Puerto Rico um, with his other brothers and a sister. They were very close. I mean, they were raised in the same home. They were raised you know, by a single mom. Um, his mom, after she had divorced from my uncle, she never remarried. You know, she dedicated her life to raise her children. And they were close. Javier and Daniel Marti went to the same school as Ariel Castro. I've known him, I mean, you know, all throughout high school and junior high, his whole family. He's got a great family. I mean, the guy was just a regular Joe. I mean, he, he was outgoing, yeah. smart, very talented. Played a bass, played in bands. Uh, mm -hmm. He even played uh, softball every once in a while. He was always like into cars and everything, and he loved and, his cars. Yeah, he had nice cars, bikes. He loved his cars. Yeah, he was just a regular kid. Ariel Castro moved into 2207 Seymour Avenue in 1992 with his wife and four children. He bought the house from his uncle and started living there with his wife. But soon things were going wrong. His neighbors, people who'd known him from school, remember it was a time of horrible domestic violence. He was a wife beater. He was a wife beater. He yeah, always he beat was. his wife. As you know, she used to run out of the house and stuff. And a couple of times she came over to use the phone to, to call the police. And, but we never, I mean, never got into it because you don't get into matrimonial disputes. Court records show that Castro struggles to control his temper. He's been accused of attacking his former wife, who suffered broken ribs, a broken nose, dislocated shoulders and a blood clot on the brain. However, she dropped the charges and the only consequence for Castro seems to have been losing custody of their children. After he got a divorce, he he always kept to himself. Yeah, he was the quiet type Yeah, he was that. real quiet, kept to himself. Yeah. And, like, locked up, secluded in the house. Right. Nobody yeah. went to that house. No. We always found that strange, though. I mean, me and Mike's wife would talk about that, how that guy was weird. Neighbors say he was guarded about who could come in his home and that he only entered and exited through the back door. His mother would come to see him. And he would check her out from the porch or come and talk to her. In the, he won't let her in the house. Never backyard. went inside that house. And Never. You wouldn't stay too long in the backyard. He walked you out. He walked you, you out know, of the I backyard. Mean, remember that day we, we well, was drinking we, back there? Yeah, well, we had I a mean, couple beers back there, but when, then after a minute, I mean, we had to come out. Castro was carefully concealing the prisoners held captive inside 2207 Seymour Avenue. To the outside world, he was living a normal life. During the day, he'd drive a school bus in Cleveland, a job he'd had for 22 years. At night, he played bass guitar in a salsa band. I've come to Belinda's nightclub in Cleveland to meet Tito and William. They've known Ariel Castro for 20 years and say he's one of the top bass guitarists they've played with. Oh my God, I can say about Ariel as a musician, one of the best musicians around. In this city, three bass players that are the best, and he was one of them. Did you feel that you knew him? Ariel was the person, he wanted to go dance. He would go and try to dance with somebody, and they would say no. Go back, say no. Go back, say no. And I would tell him, Ariel, come on, man. You can embarrass yourself. He said, no, I want to dance. And I was like, dude. If they don't want to dance with you, you can't force them to dance with you. Say, yeah, but still, look who I am. I'm a bass player. I'm on stage. I'm like, who cares? You can be Liberace, you can be the president. If they don't want to dance with you, you can't force them to dance with you. And were you friends outside of music as well? Yes, but not to a personal point where um, he kept his personal life very personal, if you will. Mm -hmm. He never talked about it. And 